Coming up on Falcon Weekly, a major shakeup at the CIA. General David Petraeus resigns after admitting to an affair. Find out what this means for the CIA. And the UM cat killer has been caught. We'll tell you more about the student behind this gruesome act. Plus, a Sesame Street sex scandal. We'll tell you about the controversy surrounding the man who brings Elmo to life. Welcome to Falcon Weekly. I'm Sarah Leifer. And I'm Coleman Sears. Thanks so much for joining us. Leaders in Washington are asking the question, what comes next? As they are learning exactly who knew what and when regarding the sudden departure of General David Petraeus from the CIA. Reporter Andrew Spencer has details. General David Petraeus' sudden resignation from the Central Intelligence Agency leaves Washington with more questions than answers. He quit, saying he had an extramarital affair. A journalist who has spent time with the general says this was shocking to her. I don't know anyone who wasn't shocked by this. Uh, he is such a straight shooter, a cornball really, you know, uh, a very decent guy. Uh, and yet, you know, this wasn't one of those things where it was, uh, you know, you knew that there must be something there. The general's affair was reportedly with this woman, Paula Broadwell, a married mother of two. She wrote a biography of Petraeus entitled All In. This project started as my dissertation uh, about three years ago. Army Sources say the FBI had been investigating Broadwell for allegedly sending harassing emails to another woman who was close to Petraeus. Lawmakers like Senate Intelligence Committee Chairwoman Dianne Feinstein say they should have known about the probe. Now she plans to investigate the FBI. I mean, this is something that could have had an effect on national security. I think we should have been told. Meanwhile, a spokesman for House Majority Leader Eric Cantor says Cantor talked to the FBI last month about the general's affair. All of this comes at a critical time in Washington. Closed hearings on the deadly consul attack in Benghazi, Libya start this week. Petraeus was supposed to testify, but now the agency's interim director, Michael Morrell, will speak in his place. I'm Andrew Spencer reporting. A U.S. official says Petraeus wasn't the target of the FBI's investigation. Uh, before his nomination last year, he was considered the country's most well-known military leader since Colin Powell. According to a new report from the International Energy Agency, the U.S. is expected to become the world's largest oil producer by the year 2020. The report also shows the U.S. will be energy dependent by 2030. America's rise to the top is a result of the recent increases in oil and gas production. Another contributing factor is that newer vehicles are more fuel efficient. Many local consumers are experiencing lower prices at the gas pumps. Prices in Montevallo range from $3.17 to $3.27. Turning now to local news, university police have released the identity of the person responsible for killing campus cats. Falcon Weekly's Ashley Rogers joins us live with the latest details on the case. Students got a real shock a few weeks ago after dead, mutilated cats began to appear around Ewan's campus. Last week, police eased the minds of many after arresting Chris Slayton for the crimes. Yet rumors are still flying across campus, leaving many searching for the truth. ...is that he had broken up with his girlfriend and began taking antidepressants. You walk talk and associate with someone for a whole semester, but how well do you really know them? This is a question one University of Montevallo student is dealing with as a fellow UM student Christian Slayton was arrested last week after being accused of brutally murdering three cats on campus. The main question now, were there signs to avoid it all? I had in comms class and she mentioned that one day they spoke about the cat killer, just you know as students to one another and he excused himself to the restroom and was gone for 20 minutes and um, at the time no one thought about it but now looking back on it it's quite shocking because maybe that might have been a, a clue of some type Slayton will be facing four felony charges and has been banned from the campus of Montevallo indefinitely reporting for Falcon Weekly I'm Ashley Rogers thank you Ashley an Iowa woman wants to get her daughter back who was taken away from her four years ago. 
June Simpson claims her daughter was abused by her adoptive parents, and it started shortly after she went to live with them. But no one would listen to those claims. Amanda Lewis has more. June Simpson has a home in Truro and a two-year-old daughter. We have a nice, happy home. Absolutely but it exactly. wasn't always this way. Four years ago, she and her husband turned against each other. Yeah, there was so drinking and violence. We were so wrapped up in ourselves and our own problems that, and had five children. The Department of Human Services removed all of them. Then nine-year-old Savannah was adopted by Paul and Joanne Drake, the Ankeny couple who now four years later is accused of locking 13-year-old Savannah and another adopted child in their basement. June says the last time she was allowed to speak with Savannah, four years ago, Savannah told her something was wrong. She was not allowed to eat, not allowed to eat her meal, um, uh, not allowed to sleep in her bed, made to sleep on the floor, and um, pushed down the stairs. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder how long and how bad and what's happened in between these past four years. Absolutely. June says exactly. she tried to tell the judge back then was, what was going on, but DHS and the courts wouldn't listen. Me and my ex-husband, we definitely failed her. But DHS has failed her, court system failed her, everyone that's supposed to protect her has basically failed her. June says she's contacted an attorney to see if she can get Savannah back. She says DHS has had home visits and now approves of her home as a safe place for children. She wants Savannah to know she is wanted and not forgotten. I think about her every day. I thought about her and talked about her every day. That was Amanda Lewis reporting. Craigslist is a popular source for online buying and selling, but officials in Ohio say that two men used the website as part of a murder plot. A 17-year-old Brogan Rafferty was sentenced to life in prison without parole for the murder of three men. According to prosecutors, Rafferty helped 52-year-old Richard Beasley lure four men to a remote farm through a Craigslist ad that promised work. Three of the men were killed, but the fourth survived. Rafferty had a chance for a sor shorter sentence from his testimony against Beasley, but it fell through. Tennessee police are still looking for who stole an ATM in Madison County. The footage from the bank shows a forklift approaching the ATM and taking it away. The footage from other angles shows the forklift putting the ATM on a truck bed where reported both vehicles were reported stolen from different places. The truck and ATM minus the money were recovered in a wooded area. Police in St. Louis County are now going undercover as pizza delivery drivers in hopes of catching those who have been targeting delivery people. Police are using this approach to gather information to teach deliverers to protect themselves at their, the deaths of two Emo's pizza delivery drivers this year. They say people ordering pizza will no will not know the difference. Police say it may seem pointless to announce an undercover operation, but they say it's like cameras at traffic lights. If you know there are cameras, you're less likely to commit a crime. Still ahead, find out how one company is helping visually impaired employees find a career one cup at a time. And flu season is here. Hear why some experts say meth can help fight the flu. That story and more coming up when Falcon Weekly returns. Welcome back to Falcon Weekly. After a life-changing accident, a Connecticut man thought he'd never be able to walk across the room or have a conversation with someone at eye level. Now, with the help of technology, he's making his first miraculous steps toward a new normal. Jocelyn Moe reports. It's a momentous day for Mike Laura, who was paralyzed after he was struck by a car while riding his bike, training for an Ironman four years ago. Ever since the accident, all the doctors have been saying that that's your never going to walk again. But this husband and father of two girls is walking that. again. It's, like it's day 15 like that Mike is strapping on this wearable robot, a breakthrough technology. But it's the first time he is taking steps for others to see. And every time I take a step, I kind of have to balance myself in a certain position for the machine to know that it's ready to take the next step. It has an exoskeletal system with battery powered motors that allow someone who can't feel and can't move, who is paralyzed, the ability to go from sit to stand to actually take steps. 
Dr. David Rosenblum is the medical director of rehabilitation at Gaylord Specialty Healthcare, the only center in Connecticut to offer the exobionics robotic exoskeleton technology to patients with spinal cord injuries. We're using it as a uh, tool to work on balance, to get someone up and moving from a wellness perspective to improve the quality of life. For Mike, it is a major step for the future. I'm gonna keep things simple and try to go slow and just to walk, just to walk again. <laughs> Be able to stand up and to have a conversation with somebody without looking up all the time. And a reality check of what life can be. I'm looking at you guys eye to eye and uh, it's, it's like it used to be. The technology is expected to be available for use outside facilities like Gaylor in three to five years from now. A company that set up shop in Louisiana is offering more than just a job for some. Three quarters of the facility's workers are visually impaired. Reporter Adrian Pittman shows us how drinking cups are giving them a career. At first glance, this looks like your typical production line that makes cups. But you would have to look closely to tell that the workers behind the machines at Lighthouse for the Blind are visually impaired. Sandra Cole is a bagger at Lighthouse. She's been working at the facility for more than a year. I love it. I feel good every day. Lighthouse for the Blind offers employment to the vision impaired. The company employs over 75 workers. It gives people who are blind a chance at work. The blind. Uh, are real people and we do have a life just like anyone else and all we want to do is have a chance to work, live in our community and be an access to everyone. The facility is capable of producing 700,000 cups a day. So that's 600 million cups in a year. The cups are sold around the country and the money earned helps keep the company going and their workers employed. People want to be able to do good work. They want to be able to contribute to society, be part of the tax base, and it's what, it's what we do. Not only does Lighthouse of Louisiana offer jobs for the blind, it also offers services to help them become more independent. They can come here to our low vision clinic and work with an occupational therapist who specializes in, that, in low vision issues one-on-one -on -one to do, figure out how to make the most of their remaining vision. But when it's all said and done for Sandra, and the rest of her co-workers, it's much more than a cup. It's an opportunity. I just want to be a beacon to anyone who may be thinking they so-called handicapped. You're only as handicapped as you let yourself become. Lighthouse for the Blind has been around for 97 years, but the factory in Louisiana just opened last year and has been growing ever since. In tech news, the Galaxy S3 has overtaken Apple's iPhone 4S for the first time ever to become the top-selling smartphone for the third quarter of 2012. Samsung claimed the crown by shipping 18 million copies of its phone during the quarter compared to the 16.2 million iPhone 4S units. Galaxy's reign could be short-lived. Strategy an analytics say iPhone 4S sales dipped in the quarter as consumers waited for the iPhone 5. Well, it's that time again for our weekly doctor's appointment. Matt Sanderlin, TechMD, tells us about the new Samsung Chromebook in this week's Tech Check. Thanks, guys. Welcome to this week's Tech Check. I'm Matt Sanderlin. This week, we're going to take a look at Samsung's new Chromebook which is one of the first widely sold um, netbook type computers that runs on the Google operating system, Google Chrome operating system to be more specific. Basically it's really tiny, really thin and lightweight, only weighs about two and a half pounds. Um, the screen size is somewhere in the nine to 10 inch range, so it, it's pretty small overall. It doesn't have a disk drive, it's just got a USB port and an SD card slot on the side. but. Um, and it also doesn't have much hard drive space. It's just got about four gigabytes because most of the storage is done online on the cloud through Google's um, storage system that they've got. And actually, if you if you buy the computer, the computer starts at 250, and if you buy the computer, you actually get 25 gigabytes of free storage on their server, so that you can store a good deal of documents or files or what have you for free uh, without having to do that on the computer itself. 
I don't know if everyone's ready to move to the cloud just yet, but it's a cool idea. And for $250, it's a pretty decent little netbook type computer. But uh, that's what I've got for you guys this week at Tech Check. Back to you guys. After massive wildfires destroyed its habitat in Australia, one lucky koala is getting international attention. April Williams brings us this story and introduces you to their viral videos you may have missed. Take a look at this. A koala bear made a lucky escape from a raging bushfire in Australia. A passerby spotted the marsupial sitting in what was left of a burned tree and gave it some water before taking it to an animal hospital. The koala suffered singed fur and a burnt paw. The fires burned more than 2,000 acres, destroying several homes. Venice is even more waterlogged than usual. Heavy rains lifted sea levels to a peak of five feet above normal, flooding 70 percent of the Italian city. Local media reports this is the sixth highest water level the city has seen since record keeping began in 1872. Chefs in Switzerland assembled a dessert to satisfy any sweet tooth. They spent three hours Sunday creating the world's longest cream cake, measuring about 4,000 feet long. That's nearly a quarter mile of sugar, flour and cream. Officials from Guinness World Records certified the cake as the longest ever. It beats a 1992 record set in Belgium. The cake was sold piece by piece with proceeds benefiting breast cancer research. For Take a Look at This, I'm April Williams. Coming up on Falcon Weekly, the man that voices the beloved Sesame Street character Elmo is accused of an inappropriate relationship with a minor. We'll give, the, we'll give you the details about the investigation. Also, with Thanksgiving right around the corner, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade is coming up. And there's going to be some new balloons in it this year, so we'll give you that and more after the break. Welcome back to Falcon Weekly. The vote is in and the charges are dropping. After last week's election, voters in Washington state approved the recreational use of marijuana. Since then, prosecutors in King and Pierce County are dropping pending charges on cases of marijuana possession. There seems to be no point to me to continuing to try to prosecute people, put them in jail, get criminal records on people for conduct which is going to be legal in a couple of weeks. I think it's pretty clear what the people of the state of Washington intended by this vote, which is for simple possession, adults, under an ounce, this should not be a crime. And that's an easy directive for me to follow. The measure passed in the state makes possession of an ounce or less of marijuana legal for people 21 years or older. The state liquor control board still must establish guidelines for the sale and distribution of marijuana. When many people think of meth, they think of the health pro problems it can cause. But according to researchers in Taiwan, it could have a flu-fighting power. The researchers say that meth-treated cells have a lower concentration of the virus in the control group. No doctor would recommend that you take meth to get over the flu, but researchers believe this study could help them find safe compounds of the drug. For years, doctors have been looking for what causes autism. Now doctors are finding more links between the flu virus and autism. Correspondent Shelby Lynn has more on today's Health Minute. New evidence out this week finds children whose mothers had the flu or a fever lasting more than a week while they were pregnant may be at a higher risk of developing autism. The large Danish study looked at nearly 97,000 children born between 1997 and 2003. Their mothers were screened to see if they had any infections, used antibiotics, or had long periods of fever during their pregnancies. Researchers found no association between autism and minor infections, such as respiratory ailments or urinary and genital infections. But when it came to influenza during pregnancy, the risk of being diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder before the age of three was twice as high for those children compared to toddlers whose mothers did not have the flu during their pregnancies. And if the mothers had a fever lasting more than a week while carrying a baby, that child had a three times greater risk of developing autism than other children. Researchers also found mothers who took antibiotics during their pregnancy had a small risk of having children with autism. Investigators say there may be statistical shortcomings in their data, and more research needs to be done to better understand the connection. For today's Health Minute, I'm Shelby Lynn. The man known as the voice of Elmo is denying claims he had an inappropriate relationship with an underage boy. 
Sesame Street Workshop has found allegations that puppeteer Kevin Clash had an inappropriate relationship with a minor. In June, the workshop heard from a 23-year-old man who claimed he was just a 16-year-old when his relationship with then 45-year-old puppeteer began. Clash insists the allegations are false and was granted a leave of absence from Sesame Street to take action and protect his reputation. Switching gears to weather news, survivors of Hurricane Sandy are getting a helping hand from some folks who have been in their position before. Paying it forward, volunteers who survived Hurricane Katrina back in 2005 are in New York helping out along with Zatarain's food company. Volunteers have served thousands of meals, including jambalaya, of course, to victims as well as other volunteers. They say with all the help they received after Katrina, it's the least they could do. Now, JoLynn Hanna joins us for this week's Montevallo forecast. Hi guys. So Jolyn, uh, what's the weather going to be like for us this week? Well, it's going to be a little bit chilly this week. Um, as we can take over, come over here and take a look at my forecast. Um, today, our high is going to be 58 degrees and the low 33. Tomorrow, it's pretty close to that um, at 60 degrees for the high and 35 for the low. Wednesday, it's going to be 58 degrees for the high and 40 degrees for the low. Thursday, it's going to be 60 for the high and 45 for the low, and then our high is 45. Saturday, it's 62 degrees with a low of 42, and Sunday, our high will be 63 with a low of 42. Now back to you guys at the news desk. Thanks, Jolyn. Switching gears, Thanksgiving is just around the corner, and that means one thing, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. This weekend, we got a little bit of a preview of the parade when the balloons were inflated and taken out for a test run. This year marks the debut of the debut of the Hello Kitty balloon along with Papa Smurf and Elf on a shelf. All right, well, uh, sports is coming up. So, Joseph, what, uh, what was this weekend like, man? Well, the men's soccer team falls in the uh, NCAA tournament, and also we have more uh, things going on in college football as well. Welcome back. I'm Joseph Antonio, and here's this week's look at sports. The University of Montevallo's men's soccer team suffered a shocking defeat at the hands of Wingate University on November 9th in the opening round of the NCAA Division II soccer tournament. The Falcons would surrender three straight goals during the first 20 minutes of the match, never being able to fully recover from the early 3-0 deficit. Freshman Pierre Omenga scored the lone goal for the Falcons during the second half with this team leading 15th goal of the season. Montevallo closed out the season with its third straight tournament appearance and seventh overall in school history. Happier news for the University of Montevallo's volleyball team as they clinched the fourth seed in the upcoming Peach Belt Conference Tournament with a win over UNC Pembroke this weekend. The Falcons kept or swept UNC Pembroke winning in three sets by scores of 25-17, 26-24, and 25-19. To sweeten the victory further, Montevallo's Manyi Ati also pounded home her 1,000th career kill. She was also named the PBC Player of the Week. Up next for the volleyball team, the Falcons will face off against the fifth-seeded Augusta State University Jaguars in their opening match of the Peach Belt Tournament, which will be hosted by Flagler College. The Montevallo women's basketball team is off to a bumpy start as the team has dropped its first two games of the season against Wingate and Newberry, respectively. The Falcons have seldom led during a game this season and have been outscored by a combined total of 131 to 104. Montevallo returns to action Wednesday, November 14th, when it hosts UAH in their home opener at Bank Trust Arena. Tip-off is set for 5.30 p.m. Check out Falcon Fever every Wednesday night for the rest of your Montevallo athletic sports news and analysis. There was a major shakeup this weekend in the world of college football as the University of Alabama was handed a shocking loss at the hands of the Texas A&M Aggies. The game ended when tied quarterback A.J. McCarron forced a pass into coverage on fourth down and goal from the two-yard line, which would be intercepted by the Aggies. Freshman phenom Johnny Football Manziel of A&M would pass for 253 yards and two touchdowns, making his case for the Heisman Trophy at the tender age of 19 all the more compelling. 
As the legend of Johnny Football continued to grow Saturday night, Texas A&M began working with the Manziel family to trademark his nickname. The news comes less than two weeks after an organization called Kenneth R. Reynolds Family Investments, based in College Station, Texas, filed for the Johnny Football trademark in order to keep Manziel's eligibility intact. Neither Texas A&M nor the family can sell products with Johnny Football that in any way hints of a connection to Manziel. More heartache on the Plains this weekend as the Tigers lost for the eighth time in ten games, this time at the hands of their oldest rival, the Georgia Bulldogs. The Tigers were handed their first shutout by the Dogs, 38 to nothing, and seemed to be one game closer towards firing their head coach, Gene Chizik. The Tigers will wrap up a long season against Alabama A&M Saturday and the number four ranked Crimson Tide on November 24th. The 1972 Miami Dolphins can breathe another sigh of relief this weekend as there will not be a perfect team in the NFL this year. The Atlanta Falcons were handed their first loss of the season when they were upset by the struggling Saints 31-27 in New Orleans. The game ended on an incomplete pass in the end zone when the Saints' Jabari Greer broke up Falcons quarterback Matt Ryan's pass with less than two minutes left to play. The Los Angeles Lakers have finally made the decision on who will fill the recent head coaching vacancy left by fired coach Mike Brown. The Lakers have tapped former Suns and Knicks head coach Mike D'Antoni to grab the coaching reins on what many are calling a dream team of Kobe Bryant, Steve Nash, Pau Gasol, and Dwight Howard. The Lakers are currently 3-4 and four and are looking to vastly improve on their season and hope to be in the title hunt come spring. And that's this week's look at sports. Thanks, Joseph. Red Bull is still at the forefront of people's minds after Felix Baumgartner set a world record for the world's highest free fall. But now they are getting headlines for the uh, annual Flutog contest. The contest is to see who can create the best human-powered aircraft. Many people come out to see the crashes, but occasionally we see some successful attempts at flight. In the end, the group Movember won with a flight of 54 feet. Well, that's all the time we have for you this week. Thanks for joining us and be sure to tune again next time.